Welcome to Fort Knox. Uh, I am John Fort here this time with Wendy Thomas, the CEO of SecureWorks. Um, I think this might be the first one-on-one, -on -one, like full-length one-on-one of 2023. So, Wendy, thank you uh, for joining me. I, I always like to start these roughly the same way, asking about today's toughest problem that you are facing as CEO. Uh, and that can be a management thing. It can be a, a competitive, strategic thing. What is it in this challenging environment that we're in? In, in this environment, what we see is a pretty big shift in cybersecurity and really solving the challenge that is both a, a, an opportunity and a, and a difficulty. And that is, I think everyone who, who watches the news can see that the number of cyber attacks and the, the damage from breaches, the cost of cyber insurance, you know, all of those things have been going in the wrong direction. Uh, especially over the last few years uh, with remote work expanding and those types of things. So when we think about our role as a cybersecurity company and solving that challenge, we, we have a pretty big business and technology transformation that we believe solves the, the, the next generation of security challenges. But there is an awful lot of flux in the marketplace around uh, those answers. And so we spend a good bit of time trying to educate the market about the real solutions to security versus the the things that are you know maybe easy to to sell and and, and simple solutions there's not a simple answer here and so we spend a, a good bit of time uh, talking about what the real challenges are and how our approach is quite different and, and helps solve those so it's it's really a change management and an industry shift uh, challenge for us as we change our own business model well, i think there is um, there are a couple of things happening in cyber that I find interesting. One of them is this kind of platform approach that a number of companies are, are going at. You know, I'm thinking of Zscaler as well. Uh, there, there are some others that are saying, okay, well, we're going to make this really um, modular and scalable and you can add things in and you can try things out and, and we can just sort of uh, even push you features and you can try them for a while and then you start paying. So, so there's that. And then there are things like identity management, um, which haven't traditionally been thought of as being security, but are increasingly a part of the security picture. There are a number of companies that are trying to sell what they do based on security that haven't traditionally maybe been thought of as security companies. Where does SecureWorks fit into uh, that mix of approaches? So we're actually on top of that mix of approaches. Our, our view, so we've been a, a managed security service provider started uh, more than 20 years ago. And our original approach in security, leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, you know, industry leading margins from a security services perspective, what we did was manage all of the best in breed security products, your identity management, your, your firewalls, your endpoints. And what we found is that the point product approach to security or securing individual areas and trying to weave those together in a quilt, it really did not work without technology. And so when you talk about a platform approach, we are taking a platform approach, but it's a platform approach that requires absolutely 100% holistic visibility into an organization's technology estate and the ability to work with whatever they have in place, different public cloud providers, on-prem, uh, data centers, you name it, we are able to, to secure the entire organization. And that it's, it's now come to be called in the industry, uh, XDR, or extensible detection and response. What we found over the years is that Adversaries weave in between those point products. They, they steal credentials and, and fool the identity uh, security, or they're able to um, find their way into your important uh, information, prepare the environment to deploy ransomware. And our approach is we want to find their uh, intrusion via their behavior. We understand the threat actor. We have a uh, very large, deep threat research team, uh, and we are in probably 3,000 different uh, incident engagements each year. So we take those learnings around the behavioral techniques, tactics, and procedures, 
and code that into the technology platform so that it can provide that holistic, not just ability to detect that there is a real threat in the environment, but to enable automated response. And that's really important because these days, what we see is that the time of, of dwell of an adversary in an environment, you know, it could be 40 days a few years ago before they found their way to the, to the, to the data or the system that they were uh, going to, to use for monetary gain or to steal intellectual property. These days we find that the dwell time before they can start to inflict damage is closer to two days. And so the ability to not only detect, but to evict them in a very short period of time that requires technology. And that's that's part of the big shift we've made. Why is that? Because in the past, sometimes wasn't it that uh, the, the d- long dwell time was intentional as they sort of got in and then wanted to keep their heads down and not raise any alarms and then eventually get to actually kicking the doors in where your safe is? Um, is it because of the technological advances in intrusion detection where they feel that they're not safe waiting anymore? Why, why the shortened time? So you have to think about two different types of uh, intrusions or, or adversaries in the environment. For a nation state, perhaps, who is just looking to glean information over, the, over time and not be detected, uh, their, their approach is different than those who are coming in to, as quickly as they can, encrypt your data, steal your data, um, send you that ransomware note. So they're interested in, in monetizing their efforts as, as quickly as humanly possible. So there are different um, techniques and, and profiles of behavior for different intentions around intruding into an environment. But to your second point, certainly the technology has changed. Unfortunately, they've created sort of specialized business models, those who, who give you access, sell you access, those who sell you the, the actual malware or tools. So as they have uh, specialized in these areas and created really a, a, an ecosystem a marketplace, if you will, the ability to, to deploy and hit many, many potential targets quickly and just frankly focus on the door that opens uh, is unfortunately creating a, a pretty lucrative uh, e-criminal trade for them. So a bit more like a, uh, a bank heist smash and grab or jewelry heist that you see in the movies and, and less like, you know, sneaking in the windows and, and uh, walking around the building, it, it sounds like. Um, during difficult economic times, sometimes um, cut, uh, companies lower their guard through layoffs and through underinvestment in technology, whether that's in security technology in itself or in patching the platforms that they're using. So they end up creating vulnerabilities. And then at the same time, it seems like um, some uh, criminal syndicates have an easier time recruiting or there are people who are hungry to make that kind of gain. Are we seeing that in this, this economic cycle so far? And can you give any detail on how that's playing out? Certainly when, when organizations become lean staffed, even in, in boom economic times, if they have a lot of turnover because security teams are being um, offered more lucrative positions at other companies, anytime you have staffing turnover or just staffing reductions for any reason in that security team or even holidays, unfortunately adversaries really like to uh, run some attacks around holidays when they know that that the team is short staffed and the less tenure folks are are on call and so that's a that's a recurring theme that it's really just the cause of the staffing difference may change but the the taking advantage of that situation remains pretty consistent so it's an observant comment on that front the second is if you don't have the teams to, as you mentioned, continue to do the good security hygiene, the vast majority of cyber breaches remain the result of really basic things. You know, we talk about you know, how do you lose weight, you exercise, you watch what you eat. It's not, it doesn't require a whole lot of technology. It, the vast majority of security breaches are the same thing. Do you have some basic, you know, multi-factor authentication in place and strong passwords and are you patching the most serious vulnerabilities? If, if you do those things, most organizations, as long as they have that holistic ability to detect and respond quickly for when things do break through, because we're all human, we're as strong as our weakest, weakest link and that click on that phishing email, 
then you'd be you'd be surprised how how well secured an organization can remain most of the time. Yeah, because um, it's it's only the sum of the time is all that the attacker needs. Some of they the only have to some of the company, some of the time, right? Yes, um, right. Well. Learned a bit about uh, secure works, and I want to get back to that and the relationship with Dell, which I think is still a majority owner, and and the possibilities for the future. But now that I've, I've learned a bit about the company and the uh, possibilities and challenges, I want to learn more about you. And I like to start from the very beginning. So tell me, um, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, any siblings. Sure. So I was born in Washington, D.C., one of those rare people actually from D.C. and grew up in that that very transient and international area, which sort of set my uh, love of all things intercultural, interglobal, uh, political. So definitely. I grew up in D.C. What part? Ah. Sorry. Say that again. What part? Um, so I was born in at GW, and then we moved to Alexandria over time, and then went to high school in Fairfax. How about yourself? Uh, I actually was born in New York, but we moved to D.C. Uh, starting when I was in fourth grade. We okay. lived in Northwest, Shepherd yeah. Park, and uh, I went to school in Montgomery County. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, maybe we cross paths. Yeah, you never know. So um, tell me, why, why D.C.? Were your parents from there? Uh, yes, uh, my parents were from the Virginia, Maryland area, multi-generational family up there, still have family up, up that way. And we just stayed there as they were working and went to school. Both my parents uh, watched my parents go to college as they were working. So it put a pretty big impression on me in terms of the value they placed on education and how hard they worked uh, without complaining and just kind of weathered every storm and still made time for me. So I don't have any any siblings. I have uh, four step siblings as an adult, but um, yeah, definitely had a had a great great upbringing watching them accomplish amazing things. So tell me about that. Watch them go to college as they were working. Um, the the sequence of events isn't the same for everyone. This sounds kind of non-traditional. What happened? Look, they, they, um, they met each other. They were uh, married and working young and, and just needed to save money and, and you know, each worked to help put the other one through, through school. So my father ended up, uh, he was working for, well, what's now Verizon, but at the time was a, one of the, the Bell Telecom companies. Um, you know, climbing telephone poles and, and doing repairs and got his engineering degree at night at GW University and uh, and just stayed with them for many decades until he retired. And then my mom was working as a administrative assistant and also was going to school kind of part time and at night at George Mason. And she ended up getting her MBA, a CPA and becoming a, a CFO and eventually owning her own valuation firm. So it was quite the, quite the journey. Wow. Um, that's quite something. So uh, a different mix of skills, but a lot of engineering uh, math in there. What, what, were you into? what were you into as a kid? Definitely preferred the, the math. Um, I, writing a paper was usually considered a, a high form of torture, but so I, actually mixed the two in undergrad. I went to, to University of Virginia and was an economics major, but also majored in foreign affairs, just from that legacy of interest from growing up in DC with such an international uh, set of neighbors and, and, and people that I met over the years that I couldn't help but uh, combine those two together. So is um, debate a part of that? What What's the the hobby and interest set that you went into some of those activities with? Uh, definitely more around uh, puzzles. I am a, an avid uh, all things sort of math problems, crossword puzzles, partly probably being an only child, spent spent a good bit of time self-entertaining, uh, but, but love that. And now with my husband and son, we really like to be outside and hiking and just, uh, especially during COVID. We, I think we learned every single park and hiking trail in, in the state of Georgia, but I've enjoyed that for many years. Um, 
so you focused in the kind of economics direction, UVA, um, clearly great school, big deal in the area. What did you want to be? What did you want to do? Well, I thought I was going to go work for the State Department. I thought I was going to go overseas and, and um, you know, represent our country and, and try to solve big world problems. And I will tell you a little story about the power of informational interviews. My father set up an interview for me with someone at the State Department who was in charge of sort of refugee affairs. And at the time, um, there was a, a fairly large refugee population out of Afghanistan that he spent a lot of a lot of time uh, working on. And I just asked him about the career and it had all the things that you think of, you know, moving from from hotspot, hotspot in the world to solving big challenges, uh, meeting people cross culturally. But the one thing that he said that was the challenge about that is, look, as 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 an administration changes and the policy changes, you have to look at someone one day and say, this is what we're committed to doing and this is how it's going to work. And the next very next day, you have to look them in the same eye and potentially say something completely opposite. And I just couldn't quite bring myself to uh, that level of, uh, you know, it's not a matter of integrity, but it felt like a matter of integrity for me that I wanted to be able to do to do what I felt was right and stand by my word. And, um, and so it was just something that didn't make sense for me. Was this conversation happening um, as an administration was changing or was about to change? Yes. It was about a year before. And so regardless of what the administration, it was just really knowing that over the course of a career, that was always not just a possibility, but probably a likely reality. And so then you thought you were going to do what? You wanted something that had uh, standards, um, promises that could be kept? Absolutely. And, and that is no small part of why security matters so much to me. And we can we can go back to kind of how I, I got here. But the 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 idea of a mission driven organization out to do something to make the world a better place. We, we talk about our mission at SecureWorks is to secure human progress. And we are very mission centric. And that's what brings people in to work every day. And when you get the call on, you know, New Year's Eve and you've got to be on site to help out an organization that's been attacked, knowing that what you're doing matters a lot and being proud to tell your kids and your family what you do, that that matters a lot to us. And so how, let's go back to um, to the kind of college portion. How, how did that influence what you looked to do coming out of the educational setting? So I came out of school and, and joined a nonprofit organization called World Resources Institute. And the great combination of what they did was to take a fundamental economic, almost capitalist behaviors and combine those with simultaneously doing good in the world. And so we would fund grants to, I was in the Latin America group, to indigenous groups who would um, find ways to sell natural products, forestry, agriculture, uh, you name it, but do it in a way that protected the environment for the long term because it was their home. And so the combination of incentive, uh, them building wealth for their for their village or their family, but also doing good for the world, it it absolutely resonated with me and and it made it easy to raise money for those kinds of projects. And how did you end up going from there to the Chicago Board of Trade? So I, um, I, I had an ill-fated engagement and moved to Chicago, but I ended up with a, with a great job um, working in the audit function to promote uh, clean, fair trading at the Board of Trade. So I actually spent time on the trading floor uh, monitoring the opens and closes. At the time, it was it was all physical. It was hand signals and handwritten trades, you know, run in and out of the pits. And that can create a lot of uh, miscommunication and disconnects. And when the market moves, the price moves and people disagree about whether they did a transaction or not. Uh, there's quite a few disputes to resolve. And unfortunately, some opportunity for uh, fraudulent activity that 
it was my role to to help investigate and arbitrate those kinds of things. It's a great way to learn the market. I know the traders used to tell me that this was the last bastion of democracy. And um, they really believed that they were doing something important to facilitate um, the the movement of goods and and uh, and pricing of goods across the globe. So it was it was an interesting steeping in America's free markets. And then before long, you ended up in telecom like your dad, but working in finance like your mom. Exactly. <laughs> Probably not a surprise on that one. So I went to to business school uh, after doing some trading off of the commodities trading off of the floor with a small firm. And I just gravitated towards finance, hadn't really had experience with someone in the family who had that type of a role, but it was a, a clear marrying of, of finance and also, also people and the ability to uh, tee up the leverage points and decision points in a, in a business to balance risk and reward. And I was pulled into a leadership development program at, at Bell South and moved here to Atlanta back then and have stayed in town here ever since. But that was a good grounding in all things around a public company finance from business unit to building a cellular business, building a, uh, the DSL business at the time. So how does a an organization think about cannibalizing its existing business because the the market and technology is changing, uh, but doing that from from a variety of different finance roles at corporate and the and the business units. Looking back now, that was an interesting period you were there. I think you know nine or so years when broadband was just starting to become something that consumers were accessing, and then um, when smartphones were just about to come onto the scene. So, you know, the 2007 uh, singular, I think it was, launches with the iPhone. And there have been other smartphone attempts, you know, Handsprings Trio and other stuff before that, but nothing that had really gone mainstream. How, how did you think about allocation of resources, investment, based on what consumers were really going to do and how they were going to want to pay for it? The, there were a few things that uh, were, were top of mind, and you, you, you touched on a couple of them. One was uh, the adoption rate of consumers, and were we going to push them along that line? You know, people used to have two landlines, for example, and then moving them to cellular. Do you push them along that line to get scale in the new business that you know is the future, or do you kind of hang on to the cash cow for as long as possible? Uh, relative to investing in those. And the, the path that Bell South went down was to uh, push to the new as quickly as possible and find ways to scale cost out of the, the legacy business to, to keep the cash flow from that as, as big as possible until it reached kind of a descaling point. But the second part was pricing. And especially in the early days of, of cellular, the pricing models changed constantly for, for those who, who may remember rollover minutes and unlimited data and, and all of those models. They were coming at us probably every three to six months where we had to either innovate to stay ahead of the competition or, or respond to something that a competitor came up and address the cost structure for delivering that underneath. So that constant uh, innovation and tension is something that I've definitely leaned on in the, in the business model transition that SecureWorks has gone through. Did you expect at that time to end up in a world where every family member over 10 or 12 years old had their own phone and phone plan? I did think that they were going to have their own phone and phone plan. I did not envision how much we would use our phone for absolutely everything, including replacing a lot of devices like your camera or your GPS. That only became clear uh, later on. But the the in in my family, we of course were early cell phone ad adopters, and I would be at a, at a baseball game or something, and someone would say, oh, "Can I can I borrow your phone?" Meanwhile, I'm thinking that's four dollars a minute, uh, but it just was a natural thing to think. Of course, this is so clearly 
better. But the smartphone generation really just took a whole nother uh, step function change to how we how we live, not just how we communicate. Why did you leave telecom? I left Bell South after AT and T acquired the company, and um, I wasn't ready personally at the time to to move to Texas and to kind of be flexible about where I was moving. Uh, I was a young young mom, and was a great run. Still friends with so many folks who have gone on to do great things from there or are still there. Uh, so it was it was the perfect way to start. Uh, a career with just a, a good learning curve around incredibly smart people in a business that was changing incredibly fast. Tell me about the, the young mom period and leaving a, a job that you had had for longer than any other job that you had had, right? Uh, mm -hmm. After going through the process of, of becoming a, an executive in finance, um, what was did, did your mom have, have any advice <laughs> about how to manage that process since um, she, she had it tough figuring out how to do transitions um, and, and handle family at the same time? How did you approach it? So my mom has been full of very good advice, both pragmatic and philosophical. And the biggest thing that she always would say is you have to believe in yourself. Don't let fear keep you from trying things. Don't let fear of failure keep you from making that next step. And for, for me in that transition, I knew I had absolutely fallen for technology. There was no way I was gonna move out of a, a company that was technology centric, ended up moving to a company that was focused on, at the time, early stage content delivery network and co-location. So, not too far afield of the industry I was in, so I could leverage that knowledge, but much smaller public company, which gave me the chance to kind of have a, a, a more, a broader finance role. So if you think about big companies, you can have very deep, but very narrow roles until you move to the very most senior ranks. That was an opportunity to kind of put everything together at, at once in terms of running finance, while still staying somewhat close to my own industry knowledge. So it was it was just about stepping outside your comfort zone and learning to um, build relationships and, and to learn quickly on the curve at, at a new company so that you can make an impact quickly. And then it wasn't long at that company um, before you got to Secure Works. How did that happen? It did. I had uh, read, believe it or not, an article in The Economist, which I've been an avid reader for for many decades now. And it talked about this emerging cybersecurity um, issue trend, early companies that were trying to solve the, the problem and happened to meet uh, the CFO here in Atlanta through a friend who was looking, they were looking to take the company public at the time. And he and I had uh, scheduled an, an hour and we ended up talking for two and a half hours about the business. And that's when I really understood the mission uh, that the company was centered on and how they were trying to approach that. Uh, so you've got a company trying to take a high growth public and in a space that was doing amazing things on the frontier of technology. And I was absolutely hooked. Now, um you were at Secure Works, and then you weren't at Secure Works, and then you were back at Secure Works. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the story of me being uh, acquired by companies based in Texas and not being ready to move to Texas. So okay, it twice. yeah. So we had we had uh, I joined 2008 again. Company was looking to go public, as you know. The the markets then took a took a bit of a moment. And we decided instead to acquire a couple of companies to essentially get the company bigger, scale it up before markets turned around to, to turn back to looking to go public. And that's what we did. Acquired. And you were part of that? You were part of that process? Yes, yes. So we, we went to the board. We were self-funding from a cash flow perspective. We did have to raise uh, a combination of debt and, and some money from a PE firm to be able to do the two acquisitions, but it expanded us into Europe. 
So we acquired a company based in Edinburgh and acquired VeriSign's managed security business, which gave us an office in Providence, Rhode Island, and doubled the size of the company within kind of two acquisitions in about six months. And so as we did that in 2009, we essentially spent 2010 uh, integrating, growing, growing the business overall. And as, as 2010 came to, to a close, we were looking again to go back out into the public markets. As it happened, we had just signed a, a security resale agreement at the time with Dell. And I remember it was Friday before Labor Day weekend, and I got a phone call from the Corp Dev office at Dell that said, hmm, you're, you're, you're selling a lot of uh, Dell servers and you're putting security software on them and what's what's going on with that? And next thing you know, we, we were acquired by Dell in um, January of the next year, so 2011. So honestly, how did you feel about that? Because <laughs> Because <laughs> you've gone gone from growth mode, right, where in, in this difficult situation where the economy turned down, finance sort of takes a risk, saves the day, buys these two companies, um, doubles the size of the workforce. It works out. Now you're ready to go public and have this trajectory that you've been preparing for and in swoops down. <sighs> Yes, in swoops Dell. Although everyone at the company was a shareholder, so it was it was a, a good outcome for a lot so of financially, people. financially. But yes, how did you feel about it? I I had a moment because I did love the company, and clearly I I left on good terms and came back later. What I knew about that acquisition that made me believe was a couple of things: a really good cultural fit. One of the first things that Michael Dell did when he met with us was he had read our culture book and talked about values and how important employee and PS scores were and, and getting that feedback clearly focused on customers as well, but, but quite, quite focused on the culture of an organization. So I knew that was good. And two, I could see that the ability to scale internationally with Dell, both via, they have physical offices, you don't have to invest up front for that, you can kind of dip your toe into a market uh, a little more economically, leverage their, their sales organization, of course, and their relationships. So the exponential growth that could come from, from writing on that type of scale was impossible to resist if you think about spreading security as a very good thing. That was the, the opportunity with that with that um, joining together. Yes, all of, all of that makes sense. Impossible to resist, good from a financial perspective, et cetera, et cetera. So why'd you leave? I, again, I, uh, my, my role here for the finance job was, was, was really back in, in Texas and a much different thing, right? Small company, big job, larger company. And I was very tempted to go work with their um, strategy and M&A team. That was, we were, I think, number two of a very long list of acquisitions that Dell did at the time. But again, young mom, home, home here, uh, other family stuff. To take care of so it, it just a move didn't make sense for me at the time so I, I reluctantly left but clearly kept the lines of communication open for 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 a return later yeah and so tell me about that first data and then a couple years later um a few years later uh back at secure works what uh at an enhanced role what what brought you back the literally the CEO called and said, we, we want to go public. And this time I swear it's going to happen. <laughs> and, uh, and you, you know, us, you believe in us. There's, there's, uh, we're kind of rebuilding the company as an independent standalone company now with resources headquartered here in Atlanta. Would love to, to have you back and, and help us tell the, tell the story to the street. And as a finance professional, even as a CFO, I had never taken a company public, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a holy grail. And I think the I started on Monday, and on Friday we had our first analyst meeting. So it was a pretty it was a pretty steep path to the to the IPO about nine months later. Did you think at the time that you might want to be a CEO? I did not. 
I thought at the time that I was going to kind of help companies through transitions from a financial seat, whether a strategic seat or a, or a CFO seat, or even kind of a PE drop in executive, because I had just seen so much change and frankly thrived on helping figure out where the leverage points were in a business and, and how to tell that story and transform the business through, through market change and opportunity. So it was definitely not on the, on the radar screen that that was the the path I was going to take from, from Alexandria, Virginia. So what, what put it on the radar screen? I, I can't help but notice that 2018 transition from the finance path that you'd been on forever to chief product officer and dealing directly, not just with product, but then with customers. Um, that's a very CEO shift. What prompted that? So we, as I mentioned, we spent about nine months um, preparing for the IPO and executing the IPO. And for someone who had left the industry and left the company for four years in between, when I came back, the differences were really stark in terms of the threat landscape, the, 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 the technology, the product offerings in the space, and where our, our business was. And so kept having conversations with the CEO and, and the leadership team was having conversations around, look, we're... We're a leader in the space, but spend is up on security, breaches are up in security. So if if we're not the one making this better, like how are we going to change the trajectory? To talk about turning the tide in the cybersecurity fight. And long story short, we had an offsite. We had this conversation around, and I give the CTO credit for for this vision of this technological approach to security that looks at absolutely everything because we saw how the adversary behaved. We needed the speed, the agility of cloud, uh, the speed of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that was the vision for how we were going to uh, outpace and outmaneuver the adversary. That's what we talk about is the only way you win is you have to you have to beat the bad guy. And we knew we wanted to use technology to do that. So long story short, um, I stepped into a strategy role. We spent about six months laying out the strategy to the board and sort of the, the business case, if you will. Well, and to their credit, they were in. Why did you step into the strategy role? Because the IPO was done. I had been a CFO. I didn't want to be a public company CFO. And um, and so it just... It just Having been here before and having seen the changes and, and where we needed to position as a company, I was pretty passionate about we needed to make we needed to make some big changes. I just I don't see a lot of moves from finance to product, right? It it just, it just tends to be somewhat of a different mindset. Maybe yeah. some of it is you know archetype stereotype about you know the, the creativity and the desire to engage with people you know of, of the folks who are dealing with the numbers and say no all the time. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> think people, smart messes. <laughs> smart yes. I, I'm just saying, I'm not saying it's it's universally true. I'm just saying that's the, so how, how do you decide that now I'm moving into strategy and thinking about the possibilities and what did they know about you that said, yeah, that totally makes sense. Wendy's the one. Well, the the presentation of the strategy, we had really two board meetings over which we were presenting the new approach. And the CEO eventually turned to me and said, that's a that's a great idea. Congratulations. Go make that happen. And that's what prompted the change. And I will tell you, while certainly moving into the CEO role was a was a big change and um, something that I care deeply about doing well. The shift from strategy, well, really finance and strategy to product was a much bigger leap for me because you're leading engineers and and very technical product managers. And for the first time, I couldn't do all the jobs inside of my organization as well as my folks or advise them on how to do that. And that shift in being a different kind of leader to galvanize results while empowering the team to to be their best selves 
that was the biggest leadership shift I've ever had to make. So how did you do it? I did that through always remembering to look for the synthesizing the bright ideas across the team. If you think about it, most people don't want a boss who can do their job as well as they can, right? They want a boss who empowers them to bring the best ideas forward and to have the resources to execute those. And so my job was sort of galvanizer in chief of bringing very smart people together, having very candid, open debate about what works and what 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 doesn't, and being able to have that honestly, because you don't want to head down a path with product investments that, that aren't grounded in the voice of the customer, they're not grounded in the market or the economics of the opportunity. And, and that's really what I did. And frankly, the team flourished under that type of uh, regime, the, the, the creativity, the innovation, the pace at which they drove themselves was inspiring. So we, a team built that platform vision in two years, uh, less than half the time most of our competitors take to build those. And oftentimes they're acquiring those and putting them together. So the, the, the journey from not a line of code to, to launching that product and platform two years later was, uh, it was one of the most exciting times ever. So the team isn't looking for somebody who can do their job. But as a leader, if you've been used to that, and I don't know if that was part of your uh, self-concept or confidence, is if somebody tells me something can be done or can't be done, I can do it in my head and know whether they're being accurate or not about it. And if they have questions, I can sit down at their desk and do it, right? Um, was that part of what made it difficult is not having that tool in the toolbox anymore? It wasn't ready-made. And so I did spend a lot of time learning talking to folks outside the business. Luckily, I'd been in a lot of technology companies, so, so good, good contacts who could be a sounding board. And there's plenty to learn online these days around what is, and, and books to read around what does good product development look like? How do you, how do you create uh, ecosystems for innovation? So the, the, the learning curve for me was also quite large on the outside. Um, in addition to, to learning from the team and, and sort of making the, making the hard decisions based on as much data as you could get, but not getting locked down and trying to get 100%. Um, there's a question I always like to ask about what I call Death Valley, a lowest mm -hmm. point, because I think there's a lot to learn from how one gets through that. Uh, wh what would you say along this career journey has been the lowest point? Was there a, a part where you thought your whole trajectory had been derailed and you might have to do something totally different? Uh, was it just one moment? <laughs> I, lowest I, of all of them. I look, the, 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 the moment for, from a career perspective where I thought I was most likely to fail was most definitely moving into that, to that product role. It had all the probabilities stacked up against it. And for the first time, that was probably one of the harder aspects were people that knew me, that I trusted and liked saying, what, what are you doing? You're not an engineer. You're not a product manager. Why on earth did the, did the company make this decision? And so when others have doubts in you and you already have some, some well-founded doubts about whether you can succeed in that role, your ability to turn outward instead of just collapsing inward, to be there for others, to lead the team, to put one foot in front of the other up the mountain through that is probably the most important thing. I guess people call it grit or resilience or, or whatever those things are. I call it um, breathing through it because if you can't make progress when the odds are against you, and the voices are not with you, then who are you? So that was, I don't know, I feel like after having gone through that, few things are as daunting as, as that kind of personal shift. What was the turning point for you? Was there a particular conversation, piece of advice, um, shift in perspective thing you read where you either understood 
uh, how to change your approach or see the problem differently? I did. I spoke to someone who is a, is a coach, and we use this firm now periodically for our leadership team as well, who was the CEO of the coaching firm who talked about the fact that you have to be a different kind of leader now. You have to be the kind of leader that helps others be their best selves to realize their um, their personal mission using their superpowers as opposed to trying to guide people through it from a functional perspective. And his advice, and it wasn't just one conversation, it was several conversations, helped me to turn, again, you have to turn out. In moments of doubt and uncertainty, it's easy to turn into your own mind, your own worries, your own fears. Uh, if you waste time there, instead of looking around at you for where the, the glimmers of opportunity and greatness are, you will miss uh, some of the greatest things that, that the team can accomplish. And so it was his, his help to turn my focus outward that really helped a lot. Let me take a risk here and ask about this idea of self-perceived competence, because mm -hmm. I think for uh, people who are um, in roles where they're not expected to be, whether you're uh, a person of color, whether you're a woman, um, there's the danger of imposter syndrome. But once you've overcome it, maybe in one role, is it even potentially stronger if you switch out of that role, right? I mean, it's tough enough being a, a finance executive uh, <laughs> in tech and being a woman, but then having to lead, in essence, a product or engineering organization and not be an engineer. I mean, when you're in finance, you've got, you know, your track record and all the roles that you, it's like, clearly I belong here. I could do all of your jobs if I had to. But then... So let me go back to the CEO question. And a, and a CEO told me back when I was making the product transition that the hardest thing for them was moving into the CEO role because you too cannot do every single job that reports to you by definition. You Very few people have been in sales and marketing and operations uh, and finance. So there's always an executive reporting to you, highly competent, um, who, who you, you have to trust them you have to learn from them. And the way that you lead and empower them is just different than a functional expertise. So it was that, that CEO conversation that made it sort of okay. No one expects you to, to have done absolutely everything. And so if CEOs can, can galvanize organizations to greatness and growth by not necessarily being functionally versed in every area, it, it sort of unlocked a uh, a mental barrier for me that had been in place that didn't need to be. So then if I, if I drill down on that, what is the core belief that you got from, from getting through that death Valley experience? Mm -hmm. I often find that whatever it is that gets you through that experience becomes a tool in your toolbox that you can continue to lose, uh, to use in leadership, in management. Uh, what was that for you? For, for me, it was, Finding the ability to unlock the superpower in, in the great talent that you surround yourself with. So when, when individuals can, can leverage their expertise, they can realize uh, their own challenging stretches to accomplish things together as a team. When you can bring together talented individuals, you understand their unique strengths that they bring to the table and put that collective group against a tough challenge that they never thought they could solve, amazing things happen. And I think that core belief of you can find the greatness in everyone. And if you can help unlock that together as a team, nothing can, there's just, you can be fearless. There's nothing that can get in your way that you can't figure out a way around over or through. And so clearly at that point, you must have known you could be a CEO. Since, <laughs> I mean, since that was sort of the, the example that you were given, it's like, well, when you're a CEO, you have to have this mindset. So as a product leader, you can do, you also thought once the product thing worked out, well, I guess that means I could 
could be a CEO, right? Well, I certainly thought, well, I'm, I, I am interested in, in learning other parts of the business, I actually moved into kind of taking on some of the operations as president uh, and building a customer success team before moving into the CEO role. So it was, it was a different mindset around um, that transition of, it was more about how do I need to spend my time? So as a CEO, the way you spend your time is so different than when you're running a, a functional area that that was the thing I spent a good bit of time on at the beginning to be very conscious about uh, leveraging that in the right ways. And frankly, thinking about what it looked like for the first three months, six months, year, and being conscious about that needing to change uh, as I sort of stepped into the role. Um, and tell me about the, the CEO transition happening as you're dealing with COVID and the team uh, having been, I assume, separate more than usual for quite a while during part of that customer success journey as well. How did that influence how you started, how you communicated moving into that type of role? Certainly in, the, in this new remote world, there are a lot of advantages and opportunities but the need for more communication and very thoughtful connection only got larger. So it was important to communicate before, but with, with folks not in the physically co-located in offices as often together, it's, it's 10 times more important. And there were two things going on. Clearly we're in a business transition as a, as a company. So there was a lot of change communication around that and keeping people aware of what's what's moving and bringing them along on the journey. And then to have the, the CEO change in the midst of that to be thoughtful around what things I very much wanted to preserve around the culture and what things uh, I wanted to kind of put my imprint on as we were changing the, the nature of the company as well. So for, for me, there were a couple of a couple of things that were important. We have a monthly all hands meeting where everyone, uh, you know, whether live or recording, because we're global, can hear from me, can open open Q and A, uh, and hear from different leaders about topics relevant to our business, and, and importantly, from customers who talk about their journey with us and what we do for them. But the second one that was new was someone here suggested you should write a note to the team every first Friday of the month. So every first Friday of the month, I write a kind of a one page email that is on a topic that is related to what's top of mind for me, leadership related. Sometimes I talk about a, a visit with a customer and what that meant and what I learned, but they're sort of personal reflections from me over the, the journey related to what, what we're doing as a, as a company at the time. And the connections that that has created across the team. And when I meet with the team in person, I was in Japan a few months ago, people will relate the story of the, the one or the two that, that resonated with them the most. They send me notes. That cultural connection and the ability to be uh, vulnerable, learning and imperfect as a leader has has opened up our culture to be more candid about what's working, what's not, what I need, um, to take that role where you don't know everything. I just can't emphasize how important it is to, to unlocking talent and innovation of being a culture that is, that is open to everyone bringing their best selves. Yes, yeah, interesting too, in, in light of um, a global business and, with all the focus that had been on being synchronous through uh, through Zoom, the power of asynchronous communication, right? It's something that everybody can read and experience and take something away from. So uh, let's let's get back to SecureWorks, the business, and the, the main strategic imperative, say, over the next uh, 11 and a half months, the rest of 23. What is it? For us, we are reaching the end of the... Uh, beginning of our transition. So as I, as I mentioned, 
services-led company uh, trying to solve the security challenge. We changed strategy, sort of started a startup company within the business to build the platform for two years, launched that now three and a half years ago, almost four years ago now. And that business has been growing rapidly, but we've been managing across two different businesses, right? The, the story of, of many experiences that, that I've had and that others I'm sure who are listening have had. And as we end, our fiscal year ends here in a, in a couple of weeks. So as we end that and start our new fiscal year for the, for the year ahead, about 80% of our revenue will be on the new, our annual recurring revenue will be on the new platform. So we've got just a little bit left in this fiscal year ahead. So this is all about emerging into uh, growth as, as the new company that we are. So a SaaS platform that combines scaled productized security services to drive step function better security outcomes in the, in the space. So it's the, the end of the beginning in that, in that sense. So in a sense, we are able to focus on, on the business that we've built over the last several years and in some somewhat of a luxury from from managing across two two very different businesses and a lot of change management over the last couple of years. All right. Well, uh, Wendy, I look forward to uh, watching how that unfolds as you continue that journey with SecureWorks. Thanks for sharing your story and SecureWorks story with me on Fort Knox. Thank you.